And Jim, welcome to the Sports Voice on NUR. What's your question? Gary Barnett for Coach of the Year. Well, I think that's probably a pretty good bet. Hey, man, what's up? Not much. Hey, man, we gonna get down here with this in Purple Pride oh, stuff. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? I know exactly what you're saying. Now, come on. Purple Pride. Purple Pride. Yeah, Purple yeah. Pride. Yeah. Southwestern come on, Wildcat. Come on. Yeah. Purple Pride. Oh, Purple yeah. Cats. Northwestern Wildcat. Come on. Come on. Northwestern Wildcat. Come on. It's the Wildcat. It's the Wildcat. Talk to me now. Purple pride rides high in Northwestern. As the Cats drive for number one to be, be the, the best. best. Wildcats <laughs> defense. A class act with offense skills from a number, number one, one running, running back. back. Steve throws the bomb as the Cats well, excel with more power than an Amtrak uh, derail. Uh, so you might as well say, yeah. Northwestern Purple Cats are here to stay. Purple pride. Purple Cats. Northwestern Wildcat. Purple cats, Northwestern Wildcats. Purple pride, purple cats. Northwestern Wildcats. Everybody's talking about the Wildcats yeah, yeah. and Darnell Premier running, running back. back. Notre Dame, no Purdue, Dude, don't have a clue. And Penn State uh, simply uh, couldn't come uh, through. Hey. Wildcat uniforms roar when they hit the come field. On, Touchdowns on. and interceptions at wheel to thrill. The fans. Come on, y'all, let's make them understand. Purple Pride, Purple Cats. Northwestern Wildcats. Purple Pride, Purple Cats. Everybody's purple talking about cats. the Wildcats. Purple Pride, Purple Cats. Northwestern Wildcats. Purple Pride, Purple Cats. Purple purple cats. cats. Everybody's purple talking about on, the Wildcats. Pride, Everybody come on. Cats. Everybody come on. Hey. Gary Barnett is a man of his word. When he became head coach at Northwestern in 1991, he made a promise to take the purple to Pasadena. When I came up here to watch a basketball game, my senior year in high school, he uh, was presenting Lee Gissendainer with the Silver Football Award for being uh, the Big Ten's Player of the Year, presented, I think, by the Sun-Times. And he had said that his mission is to bring the purple to Pasadena. On November 25th, 1995, that promise became reality. For several hours, 16 of the Northwestern players gathered on campus to watch the Ohio State-Michigan game. A Michigan victory met a Rose Bowl berth for Northwestern. This is a big, big Michigan highlights were greeted with applause. <laughs> Nervous faces followed Ohio State scores. John Spagnola of ABC Sports provided live reaction from Gary Barnett during the course of the game. That's right, Gary. Michigan's up nine, 12 minutes to go. What are you thinking? Uh, run the ball, use all the clock, and don't give up a big play. Uh, keep squeezing them. We got them where they want them now. All right, there's a little extra coaching going on here, Mark. <laughs> Anything Lloyd needs right now, I'll give it to him. <laughs> okay. Back to Mark Jones in Ann Arbor. The Northwestern players found themselves rooting for a Michigan team they'd beaten earlier in the season. The Wildcats' attitude was simple, go blue. Late in the game, a Michigan interception secured the victory, and the Northwestern players erupted in high fives and hugs. The Wildcats were Big Ten champs not co-champs, outright champions, undefeated in conference play. I want to ask our guys if they want to go to Pasadena. Yeah! The players and their long-suffering fans were California dreaming about going to the Rose Bowl to face Southern Cal. I did think we'd have a winning season that we'd be in a bowl game by now, but uh, for this season to turn out the way it did, you know, it's, it's like a dream come true. Well, this is my first Rose, and you know what? I think I'm going to make it my last and let me go again. Uh, I'll never forget this this day. It's a feel-good issue, uh, and I think it's probably the feel-good issue of the decade, if not the century. And and when you haven't had success for a long time, and all of a sudden it's thrust on you uh, tremendously all at once, uh, it, it means more. So move over, Dallas Cowboys. There's a new America's team, the Northwestern Wildcats, because America loves a great rags to riches story. 1995 was the year the Wildcats gave new hope to underdogs and long shots everywhere. 
This is a story that goes far beyond the city limits of Evanston, Illinois. It's a feel-good gift to the nation, just in time for the holidays. Everybody's talking about the cats. Very special. I think anybody who's ever worn the purple and white uh, at Northwestern uh, has a great sense of satisfaction and pride, if not exhilaration. Uh, I've been waiting a long time to do this, wear this Big Ten championship hat, <laughs> and uh, now I can. Well, it was a remarkable year, totally unexpected by all the co college football coaches and fans, and really it's, uh, it's the, uh, what I would say, uh, the comeback of a century, not just a decade. Those of us who were there during the era of Era Parsigan remember what it was like to win as many games as you lost. But even then, we were very happy with a 500 season, and it was just out of the question to think that the Wildcats would be competing with the Ohio States and the Michigan, and to a certain extent, the Wisconsin's and the Iowa's and the Illinois, all of whom have been to the Rose Bowl since the mid 80s. I'm boring a lot of people today about Northwestern. Any speech, any meeting I go into, I bring up Northwestern. What they're proving, in other words, is that brain does not interfere with great football performance. I never dreamt, dreamt of it to imagine that they would go to a bowl or that they would beat Michigan and Notre Dame and Indiana and Wisconsin in the same year is uh, pretty startling. We're as stunned as uh, people were when the man walked on the moon. I think this season is doubly exciting to know that uh, the Wildcats 10 and 1 going to the Rose Bowl when no one ever expected it but also to know that your university is so high academically and considered such a good school that when you accomplish feats in uh, athletics, it makes it even more special. Still hard to believe it's like a Cinderella season, but uh, I know those guys don't want to thought of that because they work hard to get there and they work hard as anybody else in the conference and they knew they had a talent and I did too. I'm just real happy with the way they turned that program around and uh, sure, I think it is one of the biggest stories come out of college football in a while, just come from the doormat to the uh, you know, Rose Bowl, hopefully Rose Bowl champs, it's just real exciting. The Northwestern Wildcats believed, then achieved. Doing the radio play-by-play, -play, I had a front row seat to watch one of the great sports stories of our lifetime unfold. The Wildcats became primetime players, shocking a national media unaware of Gary Barnett's sleeping giant. Victories over Notre Dame, Michigan, and Penn State, a trifecta accomplished only twice previously, led to Northwestern's steady climb in the national rankings. So, cat lovers, Get ready to relive all those special moments the Wildcats provided and savor them all as we bring you Taking the Purple to Pasadena. Taking the Purple to Pasadena is brought to you in part by WBBM News Radio 78 and by the Chicago Sun Times and by Xerox, the document company. Coach Barnett is on record in the preseason media guide as saying the Wildcats were good enough to have a breakthrough season. It turned out to be the understatement of the year as the Wildcats proved to be the real deal. During every lift or run, you know, we always break it down at the end when we're all done and everybody would be like, Rose Bowl, Rose Bowl. You know, that'd be the little chant going. So, you know, looking back, that was really the, the, the start of it, you know, to, to take us to the Rose Bowl. During the three-a-day preseason workouts in Camp Kenosha, Wisconsin, two words were on the minds of every Northwestern player. Notre Dame. We kind of had a motto that said belief without evidence, uh, which translates into faith. And then what the Notre Dame did, game did is it, it gave us evidence, and it showed us that we could do this. And not only did it show us, it showed a national audience. And uh, it was a great fashion in which to uh, prove that to some people and to ourselves. What I said to them was, uh, after we win this game, I don't want you carrying me across the field. And I said that to let them know that I believed in them as much as I knew they believed in themselves. That's all I was trying to do. On the day that Northwestern shocked the outside world, the Wildcats took the field in South Bend as 27-point underdogs. The Wildcats hadn't beaten the ninth-ranked Irish since 1962. A good omen on Notre Dame's opening drive. Tailback Randy Kinder fumbled the ball at midfield, and Danny Sutter recovered for Northwestern. Four Darnell Autry running plays gained 42 yards. He's 
Beasley to the left, single setback, Autry on third and goal at the seven. Schnur short drop, throws to the end zone, left corner, pike down! Place kicker Sam Valenzizzi tied the NU record with his 36th consecutive extra point. 7-0 Northwestern. After a second quarter Notre Dame field goal, the Wildcats drove for three. Steve Schnur connecting on a third down play action pass to fullback Matt Hartle for 17. Five plays later, Schnur got good protection and found Brian Musso for a 19-yard pickup to the Notre Dame 21-yard line. On third and eight from the 19, Schnur barely missed a diving Dwayne Bates in the corner of the end zone. Sam Valenzizzi kicked a 37-yard field goal, increasing the Wildcats' lead to 10-3. The Fighting Irish answered with a 10-play, 74-yard drive. Robert Farmer scored on a five-yard run. The extra point was wide right, and Northwestern had a one-point lead, 10-9 at the half. Notre Dame had the ball to open the second half, and on third and seven, defensive tackle Matt Rice sacked Ron Paulus for a seven-yard loss, forcing the Irish to punt. Northwestern then shocked Notre Dame with two big plays. And you lead the 10 to 9 plate. Big by Schnur. Going to go to the air. Got time over the middle. He's got base inside the first. Touchdown! Dwayne Bates! Sam Valenzizzi's second extra point of the game gave him the school record for consecutive PATs. Less than three minutes into the second half, Northwestern led Notre Dame 17-9. The score was unchanged into the fourth quarter when Notre Dame mounted a comeback with 8-19 to play. That option play picked up 15 yards to the 16-yard line. The Irish closed to 17-15 on Randy Kinder's two-yard plunge with 6-16 left. A two-point conversion would tie the game. But when Irish quarterback Ron Paulus dropped back to pass, he tripped over center Dusty Ziegler. Northwestern was six minutes away from the biggest upset in school history. Notre Dame got one more possession with 5-12 to go. On first down for the Irish 36, Paulus went deep, but the pass was incomplete. On second down, Northwestern held the Irish to two yards. On third and eight, Casey Daly pressured Paulus, but he passed for six yards, setting up a fourth and two with over four minutes left. Afterwards, Lou Holtz was to second guess himself and said he should have punted on fourth down. Instead, Notre Dame called a running play. Northwestern defensive lineman Ray Roby and Matt Rice stopped Randy Kinder a yard short of the first down with 3.57 remaining. Northwestern ran out the clock with the help of a 26-yard scamper by Autry, Notre Dame was done, and Northwestern had pulled off a stunning victory, 17 to 15. The Notre Dame game was huge for us because I think it showed us that we could play, you know, with uh, with anybody in the country, you know, our league, our schedule, uh, you know, play and, and also beat, you know, anybody on our on our schedule. We've been trying to beat Notre Dame for the past couple of years, and we never did it. And I believe that once we did beat Notre Dame, it instilled um, within us a, a confidence and uh, 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 I don't want to say arrogance, but some kind of air, I guess you should say, you know, some kind of uh, feeling about yourself that you can win. One week after the Notre Dame victory, the Wildcats experienced a painful defeat, a 30-28 loss to Miami of Ohio. The game began like it might be a Wildcat blowout, with NU twice taking 21-point leads. Second and long, short drop, now rolling right, now looks to the left, throwing for Bates open, touchdown! Back to throw to Steve Schnur, he's got a man open, Autry makes the catch inside the 10 to the 5, into the end zone, touchdown! Back to throw it is Schnur, he's got time, he's going deep downfield, Bates out there, makes the catch, inside the 5, touchdown, as he falls! Steve Schnur's three touchdown passes in one half tied a Northwestern record and gave Northwestern a 21 0 lead. The junior quarterback, who passed for over 1,400 yards in 95, takes pride in his leadership and his ability to make plays. By going out there and executing is how I, uh, is how I lead and, you know, I uh, try to make smart decisions for my team, for uh, those around me, and, you know, trying to get us in any bad situations, try to put us in the same, I mean, in a good place. 
on the second play of the third quarter, NU's Rodney Ray intercepted a Miami pass and ran it back 20 yards for a 28-7 Wildcat lead. But Northwestern squandered that lead. And with three seconds to play, Miami's Chad Seitz kicked a 20-yard game-winning field goal. Sam Valens says he called that heartbreaking loss the turning point of the season. It taught us that, that we have to play 60 minutes, that we have to put teams away, and that's what we needed. That was the only thing that was missing from this team, was to be able to put teams away. And you know, we learned that lesson very early. And I think if we hadn't lost that game, that we wouldn't be making plans to go to Pasadena and play USC. I can't believe I just said that. After beating Notre Dame, we knew we had a good team, and then we lost Miami, Ohio. So what Barnett emphasized to us was, you know, whether we were the team that beat Notre Dame or whether we were the team that lost to Miami, Ohio. And I think at that point, the team realized that we were the team that beat Notre Dame. And, and week in and week out, we started to play like that. The loss to Miami would be the only blemish on the Wildcats' 95 record. They wouldn't lose another game all season. And you snapped an 11-game home winless string when it beat Air Force 30-6 at Dyke Stadium. The game showcased the spectacular talents of sophomore Darnell Autry and junior linebacker Pat Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald's masterpiece included 14 tackles, 13 solos, a sack, an interception, and a fumble recovery. Campbell in motion, Brown hit, sacked back at the 13-yard line by Pat Fitzgerald. Morgan rolling to his right. Let's it go, intercepted by the Wildcats. Pat Fitzgerald, and he's down at the 37-yard line. Campbell in motion, option right, and Brown is jarred, ball pops loose, Wildcats have the football. Pat Fitzgerald, second turnover he's come up with today. On offense, Darnell Autry rushed for a career-high 190 yards, including a 46-yard run in the second half. His streak of 100-yard games was now four. Autry scored the Wildcats' first two rushing touchdowns of the season against Air Force in a 30-6 run. Place kicker Sam Valenzizzi, who would be chosen as a finalist for the Lou Groza Award for Kicker of the Year, also had an impressive streak underway. His three field goals against Air Force continued a streak that would reach 13 in a row. Game four was Indiana in Evanston. And for the second straight week, the Wildcats won easily, 31-7. And you improved to 3-1 for the first time since 1963. All-conference punter Paul Burton grabbed the spotlight with a 90-yard punt. When the Indiana return man let the ball bounce, it rolled out of bounds at the three-yard line, tying the school record. For the game, Burton averaged over 56 yards a punt on five kicks, tying his own Wildcat record. Late in the first quarter, Indiana ball. Hudefa Ismaili picked off the pass and returned it to the 35-yard line, setting up a 40-yard field goal for the Wildcats. For the fifth straight game, Darnell Autry rushed for over 100 yards, 162 against Indiana. Autry's 42-yard touchdown run with just under five and a half minutes to go before halftime gave Northwestern its first lead of the game, 10-7. And you opened the third quarter with a 64-yard drive that produced a Valenzizzi field goal, 13-7. Northwestern increased its six-point lead after an 86-yard punt return by Brian Musso. Sutkowski's punt is a boomer. A high wobbly punt drives Musso all the way back to the seven-yard line, makes the catch, 15-20. He's to the 25, the 30, in the open field. He's to the 50, the 40, the 30. Brian Musso along the sidelines, one man to beat, and he's taken out of bounds. By season's end, Musso led the Big Ten in punt return average and was among the best nationally with 14 yards per return. You know, you can't really realize while you're out there that there's a lot of people coming down and there's a potential of them killing you. <laughs> you just got to wipe all that out and focus on, on the job you have to do and, uh, you know, really focus on the ball and, and do what you're doing. And it's something I really enjoy doing, and it's a challenge that, that I love, and every time I go out there, just get a, a lot of energy from having the chance to do it. Darnell Autry scored his second touchdown one play after Musso's return. With about nine and a half minutes to play, the NU defense grabbed the spotlight. Ditto takes the snap. The play fake. Ditto hit and fumbled the football. Picked up by the Wildcats. Casey Daly. He's at the 25, the 20, 15, 10, 5. 
Touchdown! Casey Daly's 43-yard touchdown return increased the Wildcats' lead to 28 to 7. Sam Valenzizzi's third field goal of the day completed the scoring in a 31 to 7 Northwestern victory. Game five was a road trip to Michigan, ranked number seven in the nation. 104,000 dazed and confused Wolverines fans watched the Wildcats achieve their first victory in Ann Arbor since 1959. Afterward, Gary Barnett called it a bigger victory than Notre Dame because this was the Big Ten. The Wildcats set the tone defensively on a goal line stand early in the second quarter. They've got to go less than two yards for the touchdown here. Hand off the Akabatuka wrapped up. And he'll lose a yard on this one. Second and goal at the two. And the handoff, the Akabatuka, and he's run down at the three and shut back. And Greasy to throw on third and goal for the end zone. It's broken up. Broken up in the right side of the end zone by Chris Martin, who was covering Amani Toomer. Greasy threw it behind Toomer on a quick slant. And now it's fourth and goal. And the field goal unit comes on. And what a great goal line stand by the NU defense. After that brilliant defensive effort, Michigan settled for a 21-yard field goal and a 6-0 lead over Northwestern. Later in the second quarter, NU quarterback Steve Schnur was forced out of the game with a stinger in his throwing shoulder. Reserve QB Chris Hamdorf performed well off the bench and led Northwestern on an 11-play scoring drive. On Hamdorf's first snap, he connected on a pass to Darren Drexler for 25 yards. Four plays later, Hamdorf connected on another 25-yard pass, this one to Tassant Waterman, first and 10 at the 11. Sam Valenzizzi's 29-yard field goal concluded the drive, 6-3 Michigan. A Michigan turnover just before halftime led to another NU field goal. Chris Martin recovered this fumbled punt at the Michigan 38 with 31 seconds left. On the last play of the half, Valenzizzi's 28-yard kick tied the game at six. Michigan regained the lead with an 80-yard drive on its first possession of the second half. Brian Greasy scrambled in from the three for a 13-6 lead. Northwestern then took advantage of two Michigan mistakes. Michigan's Tim Biakabituka, who would rush for 205 yards on 34 carries, had this 23-yard touchdown called back because of a holding penalty. Later, another break for Northwestern. Michigan missed a 37-yard field goal try, setting the stage for the Wildcat comeback. On the next NU possession, Darnell Autry picked up 16 yards to midfield. Three plays later, Schnur hit Waterman for a 15-yard pickup, setting up a field goal attempt. The Cats pulled within 13-9 on a 32-yard balance Izzy field goal. Then on the second play of the fourth quarter. Brian Greasy, the quarterback, takes the snap. The play fake, he's going to throw it. He throws it, intercepted by the Wildcats. Back the other way for Northwestern Eric Collier, and he's out of bounds at the 33 of the Wolverines. The 31, they'll mark it. Eric Collier's first collegiate interception set up the game-winning touchdown. With the game on the line, Northwestern wasn't about to turn conservative in its play calling. Wayne Bates in motion right to left. Schnur, one-step drop, a lateral to Dwayne Bates. He's going to throw for Darren Drexler. Makes the catch at the five-yard line. Dwayne Bates goes in motion right to left. Schnur takes the snap, play fake. He's going to throw man wide open. Sliding catch, touchdown, yes. Matt Hartle. Schnur's scoring pass to Matt Hartle gave the Cats a 16-13 lead. The Northwestern defense then forced another turnover. Michigan quarterback Brian Greasy was under pressure and fumbled. His melee recovered near midfield. Schnur the play fit. He's going to throw. Sets up. He's going deep for Dwayne Bates. He's open. Makes the catch at the 15. And he's pulled down at the 5. First to go, Wildcats. Dwayne Bates' 46-yard reception set up Sam Valenzese's fourth field goal of the game. The Wildcats led 19-13. to Michigan's last hope ended with William Bennett's interception with 131 to play. Wolverines up to the line. Wildcat show blitz. Here comes Ishmael Greasy back to throw. He's hit as he throws. It's intercepted. Yes! William Bennett intercepts at the 21-yard line. And the Wildcats are going to win the game. 
Darnell Autry's final carry of the day, a 28-yarder, gave him 112 yards, keeping his streak of 100-yard games alive. It was now six straight and counting. First Notre Dame, then Michigan. Beating the Wolverines in Ann Arbor for the first time in 36 years, moved Northwestern from giant killer to giant. The four and one Wildcats tied for the lead in the Big Ten, shocked everybody but themselves. The Michigan game provided us with the additional confidence that we needed at that point to go ahead and, and play everybody in this league uh, straight up. I think going into that game, uh, we thought we were, we were pretty good. Uh, and then when we came out of that game, we had a great sense about ourselves as how good we could really be. I didn't try to make it any bigger win than any other game. But everybody else was not letting me do that. Everybody else was like, you guys just beat Michigan. You guys just beat Michigan. And I was getting phone calls and, you know, the, everybody was excited. I was excited too, but I didn't, it wasn't as exciting as I thought as the Notre Dame game. Not be, only for the simple fact that Notre Dame was the first game and got us rolling, got us started. <laughs> After two so-called upsets and two blowouts, Northwestern found a new way to win against Minnesota, coming from 11 points behind for a 27-17 victory. Northwestern got on the board first. Steve Schnur went long down the right sideline and found Dwayne Bates for a 47-yard pickup. First and goal at the nine. That led to a 20-yard field goal and a 3-0 lead. Early in the second quarter, Minnesota blocked a punt and recovered at the 12, leading to this touchdown and a 14-3 advantage. The Northwestern comeback was aided by the special teams. Paul Burton punted for NU, and Minnesota's Rodney Heath signaled fair catch, then fumbled. Chris Martin recovered for the Wildcats on the Minnesota 18. That led to a Sam Valenzizzi 29-yard field goal. The Cats trailed 14-6. The hard-hitting Wildcat defenders then forced another Minnesota turnover. NU's William Bennett stripped the ball, and Eric Collier recovered for the Cats at the Minnesota 32. Three plays later, Schnur hands it off on three right side to the 15, to the 10, to the 5, into the end zone, touchdown! 18-yard touchdown run for Darnell Autry. After Autry's touchdown, Steve Schnur passed to Dwayne Bates for the game-tying two-point conversion, and the game was even at 14. Northwestern turned up the dial on its pass rush in the second half. Linebacker Tim Scharf got a seven-yard sack. Two plays later, tackle Matt Rice got another sack on third down, forcing Minnesota to punt. The Wildcats then regained the lead with a nine-play, 66-yard drive. A 10-yard screen pass to Autry took the Cats to the 30-yard line. A Minnesota penalty and this nine-yard game by Autry gave Northwestern a second and one at the 11. 4.05 to go, third quarter. Game tied at 14. Give to Darnell Autry. He's inside the 10, inside the 5, into the end zone. Touchdown. Northwestern took the lead for good, 21 to 14. Later, the Cats' offensive line sprung Autry for another score. Schnur gives to Autry. Right side cuts back, left 30, 35, 40 in open field. The 45, the 50. There he goes, the 35, the 30 angling right. He's at the 15, the 10, the 5, into the end zone. Yes, it is. Touchdown. Darnell Autry's 73-yard run increased the Wildcat lead to 13. Gave him his seventh straight 100-yard rushing game. That tied Mike Adamley's school record. Autry finished with 169 yards on 28 carries. An offensive line that consistently opens holes can make a great back like Autry positively terrifying. The Cats front five, led by center Rob Johnson and guard Ryan Padgett, got the job done the entire season. The O-line opened enough holes for Autry to rush for 1,675 yards and become a finalist for the Heisman Trophy. Some of my best friends on the team. They really are. They're a great bunch of guys. They care about me. They, you know, they ask me all the time about house classes, you know, when you're going to be in a play, you know, we're going to come see you in a play. And they get me, you know, they mess with me all the time. But some of my great best friends on the team. And uh, I have so much faith in them and so much trust in them. And, and every chance I get, I, I can give them all the praise in the world. And if I had the money, I'd buy them all the Rolex. But I don't. So what can I say? You know, I think we only allowed uh, eight sacks all year, you know, which is a great number, probably one of the fewest in the Division one, 
So, uh, you know, they had a tremendous year, and they shut down a lot of, uh, of big-time players this year. After beating Minnesota, the Cats were 5-1, 3-0 in the Big Ten. On October 21st, Northwestern hosted number 24 Wisconsin in front of a sellout homecoming crowd at Dyke Stadium. Talk of going to the Rose Bowl grew louder after NU shut out Wisconsin 35 to nothing. Victory number six began with a first quarter Wisconsin fumble. On the botch pump return, NU's Shane Graham recovered on the Wisconsin 27. The Wildcats passed up field goal tries and gambled twice on fourth down during the touchdown drive. Steve Schnur sneaked for a first down at the six. Later, Schnur went airborne, leaping for the first score of the game, 7-0 Wildcats. The ball-hawking Wildcat defense came up with another turnover when Chris Martin intercepted a Wisconsin pass and returned it to the 21. That set up a 32-yard field goal by Sam Valenzizzi. A 26-yarder just before halftime gave Northwestern a 13-0 lead. Wisconsin remained charitable in the second half. Pat Fitzgerald's hit caused a Badger fumble, and then used Joe Reap recovered, setting up another cat score. Third and six at the 32-yard line, back to throw it as Steve Schnur swings it out, Autry at the 40, 35-30, hurdles a man, still on his feet to the 20, the 15, cuts it back to the inside of the five, touchdown! The Wildcat defenders forced yet another Wisconsin turnover. In motion now is London, Bevel, play fake, gonna throw, here comes Rice, gets rid of the ball, intercepted by the Wildcats, Mike Warren, he's at the 45, the 40, gets a block, he's to the 25, the 20, to the 15, the 10, and pulled down inside the 10-yard line. The defense was making it easy for the offense. Autry scored from three yards out, and the score was 26-0 Northwestern. Victory was no longer in doubt. Gary Barnett began playing his reserves, giving freshman running back Lavelle Brown a chance to show his stuff on a 38-yard touchdown run on the second carry of his college career. And Wildcat reserve Chris Rooney preserved the shutout on the final play of the game, stuffing the run for a two-yard loss. But it was a bittersweet homecoming victory for Northwestern because of the loss of the nation's top-ranked field goal kicker, Sam Valenzizzi. His season ended when he blew out his knee while celebrating this kickoff. Valenzizzi, one of the NU tri-captains, found it tough to be sidelined during Northwestern's championship run. I'm trying to enjoy it as best I can. I think I'm doing a good job, but at the same time, it, you know, to be so close and not be able to, to play is, hurts, but I'm very proud of the rest of the guys on this team. Uh, it's indescribable how proud I am. Before the injury, Balanzizzi had been Mr. Dependable for the Wildcats, hitting 15 of 16 field goals and 15 of 16 PATs. He's fourth all time on the Northwestern scoring list with 169 points. The Wisconsin shutout ensured Northwestern's first winning season since 1971, when Alex Agassi was head coach. The defensive effort was so dominant, the entire NU unit was named Big Ten Defensive Player of the Week. The Wildcats, now ranked eighth in the country, went on the road to Champaign for a drizzly slugfest with Illinois. And the Cats were in an angry mood. Despite what they'd proven on the field, odds makers rated them as underdogs to Illinois, what one player called blatant disrespect. It took a fourth quarter rally, but the Wildcats recaptured the Sweet Sue Tomahawk Trophy with a 17-14 win over the Fighting Illini. Early in the second quarter, the Illini completed a 97-yard drive to take a 14-0 lead. Northwestern cut that lead to four by halftime. On third and four, Steve Schnur passed to Brian Musso for 16 yards. One play later, Darnell Autry went off the right side for 14, down to the Illinois 37. The drive stalled, and Brian Goins kicked a 49-yard field goal to cut the Illinois lead to 14-3. After forcing an Illini punt, Northwestern scored on its second straight drive. Schnur to Dwayne Bates gained 21 to the 46-yard line. Darnell Autry then picked up 12 more, setting up a Northwestern touchdown. 
Buckner takes the snap. Back to throw it here. And he's going deep down the far side for Dwayne Bates. Makes the catch. Touchdown! Northwestern trailed by four. 14 to 10 with 4.47 to play in the half. Illinois took the ensuing kickoff and drove all the way to the NU eight-yard line before Eric Collier's interception snuffed out the Illini scoring opportunity. The momentum was shifting to Northwestern. The third quarter was scoreless. One Illini drive was stopped on an interception by Rodney Ray. The fourth quarter comeback proved Northwestern was a team with character and determination. Down by four, the Wildcats took over at the 42 and proceeded to drive for the winning touchdown. Darnell Autry provided much of the yardage as he did all day, finishing with 159 yards on 41 carries. It was Autry's ninth consecutive 100-yard game, a Northwestern record. Autry carried nine times on the drive for 37 yards. Quarterback Steve Schnur completed only eight passes in the game, but the timing of those completions was impeccable. A 19-yarder to Dwayne Bates took Northwestern to the 20-yard line. The Cats' offensive line didn't allow a sack all afternoon. A face mask call gave NU first and goal at the three. On third and goal, Steve Schnur's quarterback sneak was met by a wall of resistance. Fourth down. Up to the line. Matt Hartle in motion. The pitch to Autry. Autry to the goal line. Touchdown! The blocking was perfect, with fullback Matt Hartle hitting his man, guard Justin Shabbat getting a good shot on the linebacker, tight end Darren Drexler flattening Illini star Simeon Rice. That precision blocking allowed Northwestern to take the lead 17-14 with 6-14 left to play. Now it was up to the Wildcats defense to preserve the victory. Illini receiver Jason Dulick, a high school teammate of Steve Schnur, made a 37-yard fingertip catch that gave Illinois a first and 10 at the NU 18-yard line with 123 to play. The Wildcat defense toughened. When Illini quarterback Scott Weaver fumbled the snap, Northwestern's Matt Rice sacked him for a 13-yard loss. After a holding call went against Illinois, Northwestern wrapped up the victory when safety Eric Collier intercepted in the end zone with seven seconds left. Three interceptions in the game improved the Wildcats' giveaway takeaway mark to plus 19, tops in the nation. The Wildcats had moved up to sixth in the nation, yet they were once again considered underdogs. A national TV audience wondered if Northwestern could complete an improbable hat trick beating Notre Dame, Michigan, and Penn State in the same season. Coach Gary Barnett chose the Penn State game to honor the memory of Marcel Price, a member of last year's team killed in a shooting accident over the summer in Nashville. All season, the players had worn patches on their jerseys in tribute to Marcel. In an emotional ceremony before the game, Price's parents received a game ball and were surrounded by their late son's teammates. He'll always be with us in our hearts and in our minds. He's a great friend to all of us, and he's very talented. And it was, I'm glad that his, we got the chance to honor him, you know, and give the game ball to his parents. This was the game ball from the victory Northwestern over Notre Dame. And they presented it to us on the 50-yard line at the Penn State game. It was a moving event. Marcel was my roommate this summer, and so, um, you know, after that it happened, it, it really, it, hit home to a lot of guys, I think, and uh, I think we rallied together around that. Um, you know, if you, if you can't be motivated by something like that, then I don't think you're human. And, and that's what it was for us, you know. I think it, we were so inspired by that, too. And uh, so many guys were so close to Marcel because he was just that type of guy, just that type of player. And, uh, you know, when that happened, I think we really pulled together. And The Wildcats scored on their first possession of the game, it was a methodical 12-play, 73-yard drive that set the tone for the game. Quarterback Steve Schnur passed 17 yards to Dwayne Bates. Schnur also connected with tight end Darren Drexler three times. The longest completion was 16 yards. With fullback Matt Hartle clearing the way, Darnell Autry scored from two yards out, and Northwestern never trailed. In the second quarter, Brian Musso's 23-yard punt return got the Wildcats rolling again. The drive ended with an Autry touchdown. In motion is Mike McGrew. 
Buchner gives Darnell Autry to the outside at the 10. He's to the 5, and the end zone, touchdown! Penn State closed the two touchdown gap with a late first half TD, and it was 14-7 at the intermission. It was the only touchdown allowed by the Northwestern defense. In the third quarter, the Cat defenders were on the field for virtually the entire period. Penn State's first possession ended with a third down sack by Casey Daly and Ray Roby. Penn State got the ball back on a turnover at the NU 22, but the Cats shut down Penn State and allowed only a 24-yard field goal. 14 to 10, Northwestern still on top. On a later Penn State drive, heavy pressure by Casey Daly forced an incomplete pass. A subsequent 27-yard field goal attempt was ruled wide right, although Penn State insisted the kick was good. Northwestern then put together a drive of 80 yards, similar to the long drive that had opened the game. There were two key plays during the drive. Dave Beasley gained 25 yards on a reverse. At the 23, Schnurr gives it off. Autry hurdles the line. He's to the 20, the outside, the 15, the 10, the 5. He's out of bounds just inside the one. Steve Schnurr will take, give it off to Darnell Autry to the right side, into the end zone. Touchdown! Darnell Autry's assault on the Northwestern record book continued. His 139-yard performance was his 10th straight 100-yard game. Against Penn State, he set NU records for touchdowns in a season with 14, rushing touchdowns, 13, points in a season, 84, and season rushing yardage, 1,339 and counting. With 11 minutes to play, Northwestern had an 11-point lead. The Cats' pass rush went after Wally Richardson. Back-to-back -back sacks by Ismaili and Martin led to a Penn State punt. Linebacker Pat Fitzgerald finished with 17 tackles and this fourth quarter sack. Fitzgerald was named Big Ten Defensive Player of the Week for the third time in 95. His biggest games came against the Wildcats' toughest opponents. I think my consistency came from the consistency of the defensive line. The guys like Matt Rice, Ray Roby, Keith Lozowski, Casey Daly, Mike Warren, all those guys played outstanding all year long and they allowed me to be able to make the plays that I was able to make and without those guys I wouldn't have been able to become consistent because that's what I was lacking in my first two years here. I'd play good in the 20 plays that I was in but I wasn't consistent. I'd play good four plays and bad two plays and this year with the way that they played it, it allowed me to play very well. Fitzgerald and his dominating defensive teammates, call them the Purple Curtain, allowed just 38 points in the victories over Notre Dame, Michigan and Penn State. Nittany Lion coach Joe Paterno called it the best defense Penn State saw in 95. Well, there's great pride in our defensive unit. You know, we started off in uh, last winter saying that for us to go to the Rose Bowl, we had to be the best defense in the Big Ten. And uh, to hear that from a, a tremendous coach like that, uh, it's, it's very flattering. It just shows how much of a, of a team we are. You know, we don't really have flashy individuals. You know, we just have guys that go out and play together and have a lot of fun, and that's what we did all year long. The Iowa Hawkeyes were the opponent for Northwestern's final home game. Despite an early morning snowfall, the third straight sellout crowd of 49,000 plus turned out to watch the purple rain continue. And you came from behind to snap a 21 game losing streak to the Hawkeyes, but the Cats lost star linebacker Pat Fitzgerald to a broken leg. Northwestern's second possession resulted in three points. Steve Schnurr's 15 yard pass to Dwayne Bates took the Cats to the Iowa 40. Ryan Goins kicked a 50-yard field goal to open the scoring. Then the Hawkeyes assumed control with two unanswered touchdowns. The deflected pass went into the hands of Iowa cornerback Tom Knight, who ran it back 28 yards for a 14-3 Iowa lead. A 56-yard Wildcat drive made it a four-point game. Darnell Autry had the biggest play, going left for 27 yards to the Iowa 29-yard line. Schnurr, he's going to throw on fourth down over the middle. Catch is made by Drexler inside the 10, into the end zone. Touchdown! The Wildcats moved in front 17-14 on a punt return by Brian Musso. Here's the snap to him. He kicks from the one. Low line drive kick bounces at the 45. Musso picks it up at the 40. Back to midfield to the 50. The 45, the 40. There he goes. He's at the 20. He's at the 10. He's in for the touchdown. Iowa regained the lead just before halftime. On fourth and five, 
The Hawkeyes connected on a 39-yard touchdown pass, and the halftime score was 2017 Iowa over Northwestern. Having come from behind before, the Wildcats remain poised, and they open the second half with a 69-yard scoring drive. Dwayne Bates commanded the spotlight, first on a 22-yard reception. Then on a 16-yard reverse that took NU to the 17-yard line. Three plays later, Autry took it in from three yards out. 24-20, Northwestern in front. Late in the third quarter, a huge loss for the Wildcats. NU linebacker Pat Fitzgerald suffered a broken leg. The Big Ten's leading tackler, the heart and soul of the Wildcat defense, saw his super season come to an end. I'd have to say the most disappointing moment of this whole injury was as soon as it happened. I mean, I knew that my leg was broken, and once we went into the training room, they took some pictures and told me that my season was over. I became extremely frustrated, but at the same time, it was, uh, it was heartwarming to have my family there and uh, all my loved ones to, you know, tell me that don't worry, you have another year, and, you know, look on the bright side, you had a tremendous year, and everything's going to be all right. And as time has passed, it's more, you know, it's set in, and I know that I can't play, and it's a reality. And, I just have to figure out why some guy upstairs figured that he wanted me to break my leg and, and take that and, and turn into a positive for next year. The game remained in doubt until the Wildcat defense forced a turnover. Back to throw it is Matt Sherman. Pumps once, now he hits the tight end Price in the left flat. Oh, oh. Almost the football, picked up by his nailing. The 25, the 20, 15, 10, 5, touchdown! The big hit by Rodney Ray and the touchdown by Hudefa Ismaili clinched a 31-20 victory. Northwestern was one win away from at least a share of the Big Ten Championship. The Wildcats went on the road to face Purdue with a share of the Big Ten title on the line, as well as a shot at going to the Rose Bowl. The 23-8 victory showcased cornerback Chris Martin and the Wildcats offensive line, which allowed Darnell Autry to have his biggest rushing performance of the season. The Wildcat defense opened the scoring on Purdue's first possession. Wildcats show blitz, back to throw it is Trumpster. Here comes the pressure up the middle, intercepted by Chris Martin. He's back to the 30, to the sidelines, 35, 40, the 45, the 50, along the sidelines. He's going to go. Chris Martin's going to take it all the way into the end zone. Touchdown! The game remained 7 0 until late in the second quarter when the NU offense made a big play. Back to throw a snare, pumps once. He's got Bates cutting across the middle. He's to the 50, the 45, 40. He's to the 30. He's to the 15, 10, 5. Touchdown! Purdue drove to the Northwestern 25 yard line before the Cat defense took control. Back to back sacks. This one by Ray Roby. And this one by Casey Daly and Eric Collier snuffed out the Purdue threat. 14-0 Wildcats at the half. The second half began like the first, with the NU defense putting points on the board. Here's the snap, it's blocked, blocked by the Wildcats. Ball is loose at the five, it's picked up by the punter, Dignan, and he fumbles it in the end zone. It's covered up there by the Wildcats, but it has already been ruled a safety. Once again, Chris Martin produced a big play, blocking the Boilermaker punt, and giving Northwestern a 16-0 lead. Northwestern got the ball right back and gave it to Darnell Autry. Here's the give, Darnell Autry. He's across the 45 to the 50 into open field, still on his feet. The 45 to 40. He's to the 35 side of the 20. The 15, 10, 5. And he's out of bounds inside the one. First and goal inside the one eye formation. Steve Schnurr sneaking for a touchdown. Nine points in 16 seconds, and Northwestern had a commanding 23-0 lead after three quarters. Another dominating performance by the NU defense led to a school record 10th victory, 23-8. 1995, Gary's Excellent Adventure. Northwestern, 10-1. Northwestern, third in the nation. Northwestern, Big Ten champ, and going to the Rose Bowl. The 95 Wildcats are a far cry from the team inherited by Gary Barnett in 1991. Everyone wants to know why he thought he could do it when so many others couldn't. Barnett claims ignorance was bliss. When I came, I saw the good things. Uh, 
they, of course, don't show you the bad things. And I didn't know very much about Northwestern, and I didn't know much about its history in the Big Ten in the last 25 years. And so um, I really didn't know a whole lot, so I didn't pay attention to a lot of the negative stuff that's, that's out there. Once I got here and I experienced all the negativity and all the things that are being said, then I realized I could understand what our kids were going through. I could understand why teams had problems um, getting together and creating, creating the, the team sort of cohesion that you need on campus and in the community, I mean, Chicago as well as Evanston. So once I realized where the real problems were, then we could start attacking those. What he did when he came in here is, is he set his mind on something. And then he used the abilities he's ha he has, um, you know, the wonderful character and charisma he has to draw players into this program and sold the strengths of the school and the education it would offer and, and its location and uh, just sold the program and made us all believe uh, his vision, which was going to the Rose Bowl. I mean, he told me the first day I ever met him, Purple's going to Pasadena. And, uh, you know, it's just a tribute to him because he instilled that in our minds. And he, it took him a couple of years to make us all buy into it. But once we did, um, you saw what happened this year. He's a player's coach. We have all the faith in the world in him that he's going to do the best he can for us as individuals and also as a team. He's like a uh, benevolent dictator or, uh, you know, a, a father with tough love. Uh, but the kids know that, that uh, he cares for them and that he has their best interests at heart. And I think it's the same quality that allows him to have a uh, coaching staff that's as loyal as it is. Oh, I've talked to, to uh, Barnett several times, but I, I don't interfere with him in any way. He's got a lot of things on his mind, and he doesn't want to hear anything from an old broken down tackle. <laughs> a man who can closely identify with Gary Barnett's feelings right now is former Northwestern coach Bob Voice. He was the Wildcats head coach the last time they went to the Rose Bowl, January 1st, 1949. The Cats finished with an 8-2 record during the 48 season and beat California 20-14 in the Rose Bowl. There's a lot of pressure on you, but uh, it's, it really, to me, was just another football game. And so we, we tackled it like, uh, here comes another game, let's get the job done like we have the other ones. I'm going to play it like every other game we've played this year. Come out real business-like, you know. Have some fun beforehand, obviously, but come out real business-like. I, I believed all along that we could go wherever we wanted to go, as long as everyone believed it. And uh, this year, everyone believed we could go to the Rose Bowl. We, uh, we set our goals at the end of last year to go to the Rose Bowl. And, uh, you know, everything we did was in part to get there. And it's, it's a great feeling to accomplish a goal like that. This is a big game for us. And I think that everybody's focused. You know, we, we realize what's at, what's at stake for us. And uh, I think that you know, coming into the season and, and being able to accomplish so much now, it, it's just like, it seems like second nature for us to go out there and, and be prepared. Um, it seems like everybody's working that much harder towards this goal, and, and I think that's the mark of a good team. So next stop, Pasadena, fulfilling the promise made by Gary Barnett. Good luck in the Rose Bowl. I'm Dave Ennett. Go Cats! Well, I'm a college football fan, and on New Year's Day, I watch all the bowl, ga bowl games, but I'll be particularly interested, obviously, in the Northwestern Southern Cal game. And the, one of the things that will be going through my mind is that, gosh, I wish I'd been able to take Northwestern there. We came awful close, but never managed. And uh, I'll envy Gary Barnett and the Northwestern Wildcats for being there, and I hope that they can perform uh, as well as they did during the season. Not ever in my lifetime did I say Northwestern is going to the Rose Bowl. But what a nice ring that has to it. So if my schedule works out, uh, yeah, I would like to go. I th I've never been to a Rose Bowl game, and uh, I've never really cared about who won the Rose Bowl before. This would be the first time that I, I would care, so I may go. Oh, yeah. I, I got a special dispensation from ESPN. I switched some games around, so I get to work this one, and uh, we've got a, uh, a, we, we a runner to Winnebago. We've got a, a big party going on. Uh, I put 200 people in a hotel. Uh, it's just, gosh, it's so fun. It's, it's just, it's, 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 <laughs> I love it.
Taking the Purple to Pasadena has been brought to you in part by the Chicago Sun-Times and by Xerox, the document company and by WPBM News Radio 78. Everybody's talking about the Wildcats and Darnell, their premier running back. Notre Dame, no Purdue, don't have a clue when well, Penn State simply couldn't come through. What you say, Wildcats? Wildcats uniform roar when they hit the field well, touchdowns and interceptions at will to thrill. Watch out for the cats defense. Purple pride is evident. Everybody's talking about the wildcats. Wildcats, the top is where they're at. Purple cats. Wildcats.